Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah walhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Uh, Inshallah ta'ala, we're going to look at a very important incident that happened during the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is the incident of when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent one of the companions, uh, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu. He sent him to Yemen to spread Islam. And when this occurred, Mu'adh ibn Jabal was probably 12 or 13 years old only. And it was the custom of the Prophet wasallam that sometimes he would send, either he would write letters, or meaning one of the companions who knew how to write, because we know the Prophet wasallam died without knowing how to read and write. Uh, one of the companions would, one of his personal scribes would write a letter, then he would put the seal of the Prophets with his ring, and then he would send those letters out to different uh, different governors and different leaders of the world at that time. And at other times, he would send uh, one of his companions who was knowledgeable enough, according to him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, to go to a certain area and spread Islam. Like, for example, uh, Salman al Farsi, radiallahu anhu, when he spent some time with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, after a while, when Salman wanted the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, to also come to Persia, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, told Salman that I don't speak your language. I don't speak the Persian language. Rather, you sit, you stay with me, learn the religion, and then you go take it to your people. So similarly, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, he was ordered by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to go to Yemen alone. He didn't send a group of people. He sent only this one Sahabi to go to Yemen, which at that time was not Muslim. Yemen were Christians and Jews, Ahlul Kitab. So he sent this one Sahabi to carry the message of Islam and to spread Islam in Yemen. And we know, fast forward, the whole country of Yemen became Muslim through the efforts of Mu'adh ibn Jabal by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this one man, radiallahu anhu, went and took Islam and an entire country became Muslim through his efforts. Mu'adh ibn Jabal, radiallahu anhu, when he died, he wasn't that old. He was less than 40, 37, 38 years old, right? So imagine the amount of achievements that he had made at such a young age for Islam, for the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Also, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, on yawmul qiyamah, all the scholars of this ummah from that time until the day of resurrection. Who knows how many hundreds of thousands or even millions of scholars in this ummah. They will be also questioned on the day of judgment. They will have, they'll be lined up. And on the very first, the very first person in that line of scholars will be Mu'adh ibn Jabal. So this shows to you the level of knowledge or deep knowledge that this Sahabi had about Islam. It is also mentioned that no one knew better than halal and haram than him, the laws of Islam. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ sent Mu'adh radiallahu anhu for this purpose of spreading Islam to another country. In a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ told us, بَلِّغُ anni walaw ayah." Convey from me, even if it's just one verse. We know a lot of people may use this, and then they go try to give da'wah to others, but they are not actually well versed. Let's say you learn a verse from the Prophet ﷺ, one ayah. You have to know the ayah properly. The context of it, the meaning of it, the applications of it, the recital of it. You learned it properly, then go ahead, share this knowledge with somebody else. But you have to be properly well-versed regarding what it is that you're talking about. Right? So he could have sent other companions, but he chose to send Mu'adh radiallahu anhu because he was of that level of knowledge. So anyway, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he narrates the incident that took place, and this is a hadith that is mutafakun alayhi. 
It's collected and agreed upon in bo by both Bukhari and Muslim. <coughs> the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam <coughs> told Mu'adh that when he was going to Yemen, that I choose you, you're going to go to Yemen. إِنَّكَ تَأْتِي قَوْمًا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ Indeed, you're going to go to a people who are from Ahlul Kitab, meaning they're Christians and Jews. In Mecca, they were pagans. In Medina, the Prophet ﷺ came in contact with Jews and also other pagans. But all of Yemen was Christians and Jews, Ahlul Kitab. So as a good leader, when you give someone a task, you give him the entire background of that task so he can do it properly. First, as a leader, you find the right person, the best person, to do that particular task. And then you explain to the person what that task entails. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ did with Mu'adh. He chose the best that he could find, and then now he's explaining, this is what you might face, to get him mentally prepared. Because you don't just choose somebody and dump him somewhere and let him figure things out. No, that's bad leadership. But the Prophet ﷺ was the best leader. So he's telling Mu'adh, you're going to go to a people, a group of people that are from Ahlul Kitab. Uh, for Ahlul Kitab. فَدْعُهُمْ إِلَىٰ فَدْعُهُمْ إِلَىٰ شَهَادَةِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهُ So when you go to these Christians and Jews, the first thing that you should do is give da'wah to them. فَدْعُهُمْ إِلَىٰ شَهَادَةِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهُ That's, the, that's step number one. When you go to give da'wah to anybody who's not Muslim, the first thing that you are supposed to do is explain to them that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. So this is what he told Mu'adh. That's the first thing you should do. فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لِذَلِكَ if they obey you in that concept, this is what you stick to. Just the, shahad, the concept of Tawheed and the concept of explaining to them who Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam really is. If they understand this, accept this, فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لِذَلِكَ And they obey you, meaning they accept this. They submit to the shahada. Then, فَعَلِمْهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ افْتَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتٍ فِي كُلِّ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلَةٍ If and only if they understand the shahada or shahadatain, then you tell them that Allah has obligated upon them to pray the five daily prayers every day and night. Right? Salatul Isha is at night. Maghrib is after the sunset, which is also night. You have Fajr before the sunrise and then Dhuhr and Asr in the daytime. So this is how fi kulli yawmin wa layla. So the five daily prayers that they have every day and night, once they understand the concept of the shahada, then you tell them about the salah, that this is an obligation. They accepted Islam, they became Muslim. The first thing that they're supposed to learn is salah, the five daily prayers. فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لِذَلِكْ فَعَلِمْهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ افْتَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَدَقَةً if they understand, accept, believe in, and obey regarding the five daily prayers, then tell them that Allah has made zakat obligatory upon them. And the zakat is Take the money from the rich among them and give it to the poor among them. The Prophet ﷺ did not tell Mu'adh, bring the zakat back to Medina. If they become Muslim and they start praying five times a day, the next step is they have to give zakat. You take the zakat from the rich among them, those who have the ability to give, and they meet the nisab. They have to give zakat. It's a, 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 a obligatory upon them. You take it from the wealthy ones and you give it to those who need the money from them. He didn't say bring it back to us. So here also we understand the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. When it comes to zakat, it is better for you to give zakat to the Muslims who are needy in the place where you live. And this hadith is the dalil. 
He did not tell Mu'adh, bring it back to us. He said, those people are now Muslim. They need to financially take care of each other. Right? This is from the Sunnah. Every Muslim community takes care of themselves. And then you have every Muslim community everywhere taking care of themselves. You'll have all the communities flourishing at the same time. Bi'idnillah. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لِذَلِكَ فَإِيَّاكَ وَكَرَائِمَ أَمْوَالِهِمْ So if they accept and obey the conditions of zakat, this ob obligation of zakat, فَإِيَّاكَ وَكَرَائِمَ أَمْوَالِهِمْ Then be careful. When you take the zakat, do not take the best of their wealth because why not? It will cause some type of negative feelings from the people towards Islam. Take something that is useful not the best that of their properties, right? Let's say if somebody has camel and sheep and cows, of course, certain amount, they have to give one or two sheep away in zakat. Don't take the absolute best sheep that he has, but take something that is reasonable, that can be used by others as well, right? Sometimes <laughs> you find Muslims, they're donating their old clothes, but they are so old, it cannot be used by anybody. That's not something that you're supposed to do as a Muslim. Nobody's telling you that you give your brand new jacket that you just brought, bought yesterday, you wore it for one hour, and now you want to give it away in donation. Nobody's telling you to do that. That's the best of what you have. But when you do donate, make, make sure this can be used by the one who's taking it. Right? Let's say winter's coming, there's always uh, uh, winter clothing drives every, in a lot of places. And sometimes you see that the, the gloves and, and the hats and the jackets they give, it's all ripped up and with holes. Who is going to use this when it's snowing? It's not going to benefit them. So those type of things you're not supposed to donate as a Muslim. We're not saying give the best of your items, but give it something that is reasonable, that can be utilized by the needy. وَاتَّقِي دَعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُومِ فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابِ And then the last thing in this particular narration that the Prophet ﷺ said, he told Mu'adh, be mindful, be fearful of the dua of the oppressed. Why? فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَاب Because there is no veil between the oppressed person making dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepting the dua. So don't oppress anybody. That's the point. Be careful, be fearful of the dua made by those who are oppressed. Because when the oppressed person makes a dua, there is no veil between that dua and Allah, meaning Allah will accept it. So you as a Muslim, as a governor, that's what he was being sent as, do not oppress anybody. Because the oppressed person can cry to Allah and complain about you, and then you are doomed. So these are the advices that the Prophet ﷺ gave to Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, the instructions that he gave. And this is one of the narrations, and we're going to look at some of the other narrations because the advice was longer. This was the, uh, the amount of instructions that Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma who was present, he heard. Some of the other narrations, as we'll mention, the other companions mentioned other things that the Prophet ﷺ told Mu'adh. But here, we can pause here. What are the lessons so far? Especially us living in this non-Muslim land, you're going to come across Christians, Jews, atheists, Hindus, Buddhists, so many other people in your schools, in your colleges, in your workplaces. They'll have so many questions about Islam. They see things in the media. They have so many questions, so many curiosities, so many false assumptions. Leave all of that aside and you focus on step number one. Who is Allah? Who's their creator? The creator is one. And they're, submit, they're supposed to submit to that one creator. Focus on La ilaha illallah. Don't worry about, oh, how come your women cover up? Oh, why do you guys have a beard? How come you can't drink alcohol? How come you can't have a girlfriend? How come you can't have a boyfriend? Uh, why, do, why don't you go work here and go work there? They'll have tons of questions. None of this will make sense to them if they don't even understand who Allah is. Because from whom do all these rules and regulations come from? It's not the scholars who make these rules and regulations. It's not our parents. It's not our grandparents. It's not us. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made these laws for us to follow. Allah commanded certain things, Allah prohibited certain other things. So by explaining these laws to them, you're not going to really achieve much. The goal of us as Muslims is to make sure that the message of Islam, the concept, the core foundation of Islam is understood by the people. By ourselves, first and foremost, and those who are not Muslim. And Islam comes from Allah. So if the one is, if the person is shaky in his or her understanding of the Creator, then definitely the person will be shaky in everything else that comes from the Creator. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ, he made sure Mu'adh understood. Don't talk about anything else. Only if they understand Allah, they understand La ilaha illallah, they understand Muhammad ﷺ being the messenger. Only then you move to level number two, which is the Salah. So for us living in non-Muslim lands, this is very important. You can be easily dragged into so many kinds of debates. It's a never-ending debate. Oh, you, you, your brothers and sisters are terrorists. This, that, so many things. All right, let's go back. Step one. Right, let's say, uh, of course, this didn't start from October 7th. It started 100 years ago, but that's how the media makes it look like, as if this uh, Palestinian occupation just came from October 7th. Right, many people have these questions. Why, why, why is Palestine so important to you? Why, why, why can't the Jews live there? And all this stuff. Let's go back to Allah. Let's go back to Allah's prophets of Ibrahim, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. Let's go back to the root of the religion. Then you'll understand what's going on here. So anytime you're faced with any type of question, bring it back to la ilaha illallah. Let's, okay, I'll answer your question, I'll get there, but let's understand first who created us. Why do we Muslims do what we do? Why do we believe in what we believe in? Because it's from Allah. You have to explain who Allah is. And that is what the Prophet ﷺ did himself for the first 13 years in Mecca. There was no salah, there was no fasting in Ramadan, there was no hajj, there's no zakat, there's no uh, stop drinking alcohol, stop sleeping around with women. and all. None of these came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For 13 years, all what Allah revealed were ayat about tawheed and ayat about jannah and jahannam. What happens to you after you die? how there's a day of resurrection, how there's a heaven and hell, and who created you. That was it. And we'll talk about the ayat referring to the previous prophets and messengers. No rules and regulations were there for the first 13 years in Mecca. Because you're talking to a people who do not believe in Allah. So first clarify the concept of Allah, the concept of the messengers of Allah, the miracle of the Qur'an. These are the things that you are supposed to uh, focus on. And then eventually they will, if Allah has written guidance for that person, they will either turn away from Islam or they will accept Islam. The one who accepts Islam, the man or woman, now this is our brother and sister. The first thing we have to do is teach them the salah five, five times a day. So everything has a step-by-step -step process. Same thing with Muslims, because the reality is a lot of Muslim families are ignorant about Islam. A lot of Muslim young men and women are ignorant about Islam. They might be 15, 20 years old, but they cannot even tell you anything. Even the most basic foundation of Islam, they don't know. We have to, when we teach them, we also have to teach them from the very beginning. Because they don't know anything. Da'wah is always done in that same process. This is the way Allah taught humanity about Himself. This is how every prophet and messenger came and taught their people. You and I cannot invent a new method today. It's not going to work. Throughout human history, human beings were told about Allah in the same way. So we have to follow that process as well. Uh, then there's other narrations that's also mutafaqun uh, alayh, but this is from Abu Burda radiallahu anhu, who was also sitting in that gathering when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was talking to Mu'adh. So now we have another added sentences from that same gathering by the other companions. Uh, but, back, uh, but before we get to that, you remember the context or the background of Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Right? If I, today, I come here, let's say we grab Sifat and Ahmed and Fatin and Abid, 
let's go to Mexico, we're going to give them da'wah. I don't know Spanish, and I'm sure none of these four teenagers know Spanish either. Who am I going to give da'wah to when I don't even speak the language? No, no, let's just go there. Let's go there, spend a month there, let's try to give da'wah. None of us speak the language. This is not wise, and this is not how da'wah is done, right? I remember, subhanAllah, this was when I was in college. Uh, I was sitting in the masjid. A couple of brothers, they came, and by coincidence, they happened to be from Bangladesh, right? So they were talking to me. They didn't realize, by looking at me, they didn't know I was Bengali, okay? <laughs> so they were talking, and from the accent, I understood that they're probably Bengali, right? So I just, then I started speaking whatever, you know, I knew. So I said, oh, you're from Bangladesh, okay. So I said, asked them, like, Who are you from, why are you guys here? Are you new here? It's like, no, no, we just came to visit. We came to spread Islam here. Okay, their English, I couldn't even understand. And so I asked them, do you know any other English? It's like, no, whatever broken English that they were speaking. So I said, who are you going to give da'wah to? Who? I said, how much money did you spend? They told me the ticket prices and hotel prices and all of this. I said, what do you think is better for you? What is more rewarding for you? You coming here not knowing a word of English properly, but you're going to go down the streets and give da'wah to people. Or you could have used all that thousands of dollars that you spent to feed some poor people in Bangladesh. Which one do you think is more rewarding in sight of Allah? Then they were quiet. I said, don't do this. This is not the way Islam spread. This is not the way the Prophet ﷺ allowed his companions to do things. But many times people get emotional. I want to do something for Islam. Okay, that's great. Now let's go back. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? And how did he do it? He's sending Mu'adh, who can communicate with the Yemenis. And he's a person of knowledge. He can convince the people. He can debate with the people. He has that full knowledge and background. This is the perfect person. But if we go, you know, all right, let's go to, uh, I don't know, let's go to Germany. I don't speak German. I don't know anything about German. I will not be effective there. Rather, people who speak the language, who are well versed in Islam, speaking German, they should do the da'wah there. Right? So there's wisdom in the way the Prophet ﷺ taught things, and it's productive. Otherwise, we find ourselves wasting money, wasting our time, energy, and then we burn ourselves out. So follow the sunnah in every aspect. So anyway, in the other narration, that's also muttafaqun alayh, the Prophet ﷺ told Mu'adh, yassira wa la tu'assira. Make things easy and do not make things difficult. Wabashira wa la tunaffira. And give people the good news and do not Repel the people. Don't push them away. And cooperate with each other and do not cause, do not become divided from one another. So this is another added instruction. You talk about La ilaha illallah. You talk about that I'm the messenger of Allah. Then they obey, they accept, they believe. You tell them about the salah. You tell them about zakat. You also make things easy for them. Yassira wala tu asira. What does it mean easy? Does it mean you trim the religion from here and there and throw things away? Oh, this thing looks difficult. 2024, almost 2025. I can't really practice this. Yeah, forget it. No, that's not called making things easy. Rather, teach the people in doses. Make it easy on them. Give them ideas on how they can practice things. Like, let's give an example here. Suppose someone asks us, he has a haram job. Okay, he has a haram job. Let's say somebody works in the casinos, and he's asking, is the job haram? Of course it is, regardless of what you do. There's two ways you can help him. I can tell him, right now, go to the office and resign. And you have no money to buy food for yourself, your wife, and children tomorrow. Or we can tell them, put a limit. I'm one month, that's it. In this month, you work extra hard to find a halal alternative. Right away, you give up the job. 
and so you are not putting yourself and your family at, in the streets. Or it could be a third situation where the man has saved up money that he can live off for a few months. We can say, okay, you know what? Now you can depend on Allah since you have some money saved up. You and your family is not going to end up in the streets. No problem. Have tawakkul on Allah. Quit the job and use that saved up money for the next five, six months and seriously work hard to get a halal job. This is how you make things easy for the people. Help them leave the haram. Give them the proper ideas. Because if we tell the people, which is true, it's haram. You have to tell them it's haram. You have to give this up. No, you need to give it up right now. Not everybody has that ability. Somebody might have saved up money. Okay, for him we'll say, give it up right now because you have saved up money to live for a year. Inshallah, you'll get another job within a year. Other people... They're living paycheck to paycheck. If they get a paycheck this week on Friday, by Monday it's gone. For that person, I cannot tell him, go quit right now. Who's going to help him and his wife and children? If he's by himself, okay, that's a different story. You can feed one stomach somehow. Don't worry about it. So everybody's background is different. And you will have to understand the context of that person, that person's background. And you help that person, guide him in that direction. But of course we can't say, oh, it's okay, take five years to work something out. No. That's not making things easy. In terms of dunya, you're making it easy. But in terms of akhirah, you're making things hard for him. Right? So you have to understand the background of every individual is different. And, no, and the one who has the proper knowledge, the one who can understand the context, has the experience, that person will be able to answer the things for this person. So, yassira wala tu asira. Somebody is doing 10 wrong things. And I meet him for the first time in my life. And I point out everything that he's doing wrong in that first sitting. He will never talk to me again. Right? Wabashira wala tu nafira. I didn't give him the good news. I didn't bring him close to me. I actually pushed him away completely. Rather, let's say I see somebody doing 10 wrong things. You have to analyze which one is worst, and you only hit that one first. So let's suppose someone commits shirk, he commits bid'ah, and he has a haram job, and a bunch of other things. Which one are you supposed to start with? The shirk. Let's stop him from worshipping graves and wearing things and all these other things, mumbo jumbo that people do. That's number one. Let's not even talk, worry about his haram job right now. First, let him come to Tawheed. Okay. Then let's see if this brother or sister is praying five times a day or not. Let's get them on, on that page first. This is how you are supposed to teach the people. Right? This is what the Prophet ﷺ meant to Mu'adh. Yassira wa la tu'assira. Make things easy. Do not make things difficult. Give them the glad tidings. Don't just push them away. And, وَتَطَعْوَ وَتَ and cooperate with them. Do not cause division. You cooperate with them in what is good. You're doing something from the Quran and Sunnah. Oh, let me help you. Right? But if somebody is doing something from the Quran and Sunnah, you, you got some personal beef with him. No, I'm not going to help you. No, now you're causing division. This person is actually doing the right thing. Why don't you help him? So he will see that you're really there, you're caring. Right, you're caring. Somebody wants to do something that is legitimately from the Sharia of Allah. If I go help him at that moment, this person will understand that no, this person really cares about me. I am doing something good from the deen. There's evidence for it. And he has helped me. Now the person, even when he's doing something that's not from the deen, say, brother, listen, you did that good thing, I helped you. But this bad thing that you're doing, I can't help you. Let's fix this up a little bit. So the Prophet ﷺ taught Mu'adh hikmah. That you are going to be the teacher there, and you're going to be the ruler there, as a governor, the leader. So he's teaching him everything about da'wah, about teaching, how to understand people's context, backgrounds, and uh, deliver the message accordingly, and to help them improve. And to help them improve. And this cooperation 
the, uh, because Mu'adh eventually became the governor, it taught him to cooperate and not to become a tyrant over the people that he's in charge of. Right? This is, and especially us men, either today or tomorrow, there will come a time where you become the leader of your house. One day, of course, those of us who are married, alhamdulillah, we have to continuously ask Allah to help us. Those of you who are single, one day you're going to get married. Then you become your own, the leader. Your father is no longer a leader over you. You are going to be the leader over yourself, your wife, and then eventually children and the children. You have to understand that you have to take things easy. Don't make it super difficult on your family. You need to understand the context of what's happening. And you need, you need to cooperate in the things that are good and not become a tyrant over them, be abusive over them. All of this comes in your way. And you will have to maneuver yourself bi'idnillah properly. Otherwise, there will be a backlash. Many times we find fathers, maybe they were not practicing before. Or mothers, they were not practicing before. Alhamdulillah, Allah guided them. They found Islam properly. They found the Sunnah. They found Tawheed. All of this is happening. But sadly, reality is the son or daughter is now 25, 20, 25 years old. You cannot use the approach that as if the son or daughter is five years old. You were ignorant about Islam. You did certain things with them just yesterday. Allah guided you and your wife. You understand what's wrong now. But those children are not children. They're full-grown adults and they have a mind of their own. And now at the age of 25, if you want to enforce what you just learned today, you're going to lose the kids. You have to understand that they learned the wrong thing because of you. You never taught them when they were children because you yourself didn't know. So at that moment, the parents need to use wisdom. You have to own up to your mistakes. My dear son, my dear daughter, I was doing haram, I didn't know. But now we learned. Let's change as a family. You have to take the easy, soft approach with loving and care. Right? Many times I find fathers, they'll complain. Oh, my son's not praying five times a day. My daughter's not praying five times a day. And you ask the brother, when did you start praying five times a day? Oh, six months ago. You started praying five times a day in your 60s, subhanAllah. Right? So you already exposed them to a life that it's okay not to pray five times a day. So you have to understand that. And now you have to use the soft approach with your children. Right? But if you're doing something from day one, that's a different story. But you yourself was all over the place. And now you're trying to enforce the same type of change in your children. No, it's from Allah. Huda came to you, but it did not come to your son and daughter. Now it's your responsibility to teach, to become the teacher in the house. So everything has its proper place and context. Sometimes harshness is required, sometimes softness is required. Right? Any, anywhere. Sometimes you might, even as us as Imams of Masajid, Sometimes we are soft, everything's going straight, straight, straight. Some people try to take advantage of the softness. Then you have to put your foot down. Whoa, hold on. Right? We can't always be harsh. We cannot always be soft. If you're always harsh, you'll push people away. If you're always soft, some people will take advantage of it. And they'll try to bring in all their wrong ideas. Oh, it's okay, okay. He's very soft-hearted. It's okay. He'll understand. Right? No. So there is a time to put your foot down and there is a time to be soft. The, the good, the successful believer is the one who understands the balance. Certain issues, be relaxed. Certain issues, no. I have to do it right now. Right? So you have to analyze every situation differently. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ taught Mu'adh radiallahu anhu. In another narration in Sahih al-Bukhari from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu in relation to this, he said, Inna dina yusrun walan yushad that dina ahadun illa ghalaba. The Prophet ﷺ said the religion is easy. No one overburdens himself except that he is going to be destroyed. He's not going to be able to continue. Many people misunderstand this hadith. They think the religion is easy. 
Ah, don't tell people to grow their beard. Don't tell the lady to wear the hijab. It's easy, it's easy. Take it easy. No, that's not what the Prophet ﷺ is talking about. Because the very next sentence he said, فَسَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالْغَدْوَةِ وَالْرَوْحَةِ وَشَيْءٍ مِنَ الدُّلْجَةِ Very next sentence he explained what he meant. Do things in doses. Be consistent, be regular. Don't go to extreme one day and forget about it the next 10 days. The deen is easy. Don't overburden yourself because you will not be able to continue. Just read the hadith properly and you'll understand what he meant. Because let's say, what happens? I was giving this example in Ramadan. Yeah, the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba, they prayed tahajjud for hours and hours. If we did that, you know what? We're going to pray tahajjud today, tonight, for all the way from Isha until Sahur. Half of the people will leave. And they'll never come back for taraweeh the next night to this masjid. What benefit did I get out of that? Rather, do it consistently. Even if it's small. Right? Or you find some people, subhanAllah, they pray qiyam in Ramadan and the whole year they never pray anything again with it or anything, right? They don't pray it again. Rather be whatever it is. You have options. Three rakat, five rakat, seven, nine, up to eleven. Do what is easy for you. You want to pray three rakat every night? Sometimes five, sometimes seven, sometimes nine, sometimes eleven. At least three you get the way. You will be consistent and you're doing something good. So this is what the Prophet ﷺ said. That you should not be extremists. Be near to perfection. You do things, you worship Allah in the mornings, in the afternoons and at night. Uh, do things uh, consistently, even if it's a small amount. The religion is easy, don't worry. You don't have to do everything today and then you forget about it the next six months. Take things step by step. Right? You come to a place that's new or whatever the case, you have to analyze, okay, what are the people doing wrong? They're doing a 20 different wrong things. I cannot talk about all 20 wrong things in the same day. Let's start from what is worst. The first month you address one issue. The second month another two issues. The third month another issue. Then you see by four or five months all the bid'ah is gone. Bidnillah. Right? Because people are emotional. Right? Let's say somebody's doing something wrong. He's got 20 things or she has 20 things wrong in her. And I just point out what's going to happen. So I don't do anything right in my life? Forget you. I'm going to somebody. <laughs> you have to keep them motivated. MashaAllah, brother, these five things you're doing, excellent. These two things you're doing, let's work on it. It's not right. That person will feel better. But if I just say, oh, these two things you're doing is wrong, wrong, wrong. Oh, I don't do anything right. <laughs> right? So this is a negative form of da'wah. It does, it's not going to benefit anybody. In the end, the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned to Mu'adh that وَاتَّقِي uh, وَاتَّقِي دَعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُومِ فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابِ Be careful or be mindful. Be fearful of the dua that the oppressed person makes. Meaning don't oppress anybody. In another hadith in the Musnad of Ahmed from Anas ibn Malik, الله عنه, the Prophet ﷺ said, اتقوا دعوة المظلوم وإن كان كافرا فإنه ليس دونها حجاب. Be cautious, be fearful of the dua that is made by the one who is oppressed in كان كافرا even if he's a kafir. Because sometimes as Muslims we think it is okay we're not going to cheat our Muslim brothers and sisters but it's okay to cheat the kuffar. And we give ourselves fatwa. Oh no, they're kafir. Well, no, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, don't oppress any human being, even if the person's a kafir. Because if the kafir someday, all of a sudden, says, oh God, he's calling out to Allah, and makes something, a, a dua against you, Allah will accept it. Because Allah always accepts the dua of those who are mavloom, who are oppressed. Always. So do not oppress people, even if the person's a kafir. Right? Even if the person is a kafir. Uh, this is a true story, wallah. A brother that I know, that he used to study in Temple University. <laughs> uh, he was on the subway. Somebody pulled out a uh, gun on him. So he was like, give me everything. Give me your wallet and everything. 
So, you know, he pulled out the wallet, saw that he's a Muslim. He's like, oh, I don't steal from the Muslims, assalamu alaikum. And the guy left. I was like, <laughs> he's like, he's like, Sheikh, I had the worst, I thought I'm going to die. But then I ended up laughing. <laughs> right? This is a really bad, I mean, what type of religion are you following? So you're going to rob a kafir at gunpoint? No, this is haram. You can't rob anybody. Right? You can't do these type of things even to kuffar. Right? Many times we'll think, people will think, it's okay, this is a kafir government, let's cheat them. No, you can't do this. As a Muslim, you cannot think this way. You have to be honest to the best of your ability. Right? Or you own a store. That's ah, okay, let me charge the kafir some ridiculous price. It's okay. No, you cannot do these type of things. You have to be fair and just with every human being. That's the command from Allah and that's the sign of Islam, justice. Justice is one of the attributes of Islam. That you have to be just with every individual, man, woman, old, child, whatever. Muslim, kafir, doesn't matter. We are supposed to be just even with the animals. Right? Even, like look at what happens during Udhiyah time. The Prophet ﷺ said, do not kill your animal twice. And the Sahaba asked, what do you mean kill the animal twice? He's like, you're going to slaughter one sheep. Why are you making the other sheep watch that you're killing the other one? Why are you killing him twice? Rather, when you're going to slaughter the cow or the sheep or the camel, do it individually so the other animals don't see what's about to happen. Subhanallah. That's Islam. That's the justice of Islam. Don't oppress anyone or anything. So this is what the Prophet ﷺ warned Mu'adh. And in the narration of, uh, in another narration that's in the Musnad of Ahmed, Mu'ad said that when the Prophet ﷺ sent me to Yemen, he told me, إِيَّاكَ وَالتَّنَعُمَ فَإِنَّ عِبَادَ اللَّهِ لَيْسُ بِالْمُتَنَعِمِينَ متنعمين. Be aware of luxury. Because Mu'ad is going to become a governor. Don't live so lavishly and then everybody else is starving or whatever the case may be. Luxury is not from the servants of Allah. You stay within your means, right? There's a balance. This also does not mean somebody, mashallah, makes lots of money, good enough money. He doesn't do anything for himself or his wife or children, lives like a complete poor person. This is not from Islam either because now you're being ungrateful to Allah. Allah has blessed you. Spend on yourself, spend on your family, but don't go become extravagant. Right? Don't become extravagant. What would be extravagance? Let's say, mashallah, you, you made, you're a successful businessman, successful engineer, doctor, whatever it is that you do. You worked hard and you have cash money to buy yourself a nice car for yourself and your family. Maybe you want to buy your family a, and yourself a Mercedes SUV. No problem. You want to spend seventy, eighty thousand dollars buy yourself one, you can afford it? Okay. No problem. You are also doing charity work, you have some money, you spend, you be grateful to Allah, He blessed you with it, you spend on yourself, get a nice ride, no problem. But then, somebody goes and buys one car for three million dollars. What is this? Right, you go buy yourself a Bugatti. One car is three million dollars? This is, I mean, subhanallah. Why would anybody do that? Right? With three million dollars, you can buy so many houses, start flipping houses, and you can turn the three million to 20 million by the end of the year, <laughs> right? Think. Or you can feed so many poor people. Or you have three million dollars, keep one and a half million for yourself and your family, give the other one and a half million away in charity. You're still a millionaire, right? So, but this is the culture we live in. And everybody, you know, the YouTube channels and Instagrams, Somebody buys a new Ferrari, he's making his channel, he's showing, oh, thank you, thank you, you guys. It's, I couldn't have done it without you guys following my channel. <laughs> you were like, what, what type of foolishness is this? Right? You guys help me. Because you're becoming his followers, you're giving him views, and he's the one making money from YouTube. And you're just watching him and feeling sad. <laughs> right? So subhanAllah, you, you have to be careful. This is not the kind of luxury that the servants of Allah are supposed to chase. But if you have some money that Allah has blessed you, your halal work, yes, spend on yourself. Because otherwise you're ungrateful. Sometimes you find people, the owner of Ikea, 
He's a billionaire. The owner of Ikea, he's a billionaire, but I don't know if he changed his car yet or not. But he used to still drive his 40-year-old Volvo and still live in a little house and he's going, using a bicycle to go to work. Wallahi, this is a loser. This is a loser. You don't believe in Allah, you have all this money and still you're doing, living like this, you're not going to get the akhirah nor are you getting the dunya. Even though Allah has given you the money. So we don't go into extreme in either direction. Okay, I extreme in either direction. Now you're being ungrateful to Allah. So as a Muslim, you don't go to either extreme. Be balanced. Allah has blessed you with wealth. You don't live an extravagant life. You live a nice, comfortable life with your family. Do certain things for yourself, no problem. And you also use the wealth to do charity work. If you're doing both, no problem. That's the way. Look at Umar radiallahu anhu. He kept half of the wealth for himself and his children and his family. The other half, he gave it away. Only Abu Bakr said, take everything. But that was only Abu Bakr. Even Umar radiallahu anhu could not reach Abu Bakr. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did not shun Umar. Look at the example of Uthman radiallahu anhu. One of the richest sahaba. In one battle, he gave hundreds of camels to the Prophet ﷺ, and Allah gave him more. So you would think, brother, why do you have 1,000 camels? This is extravagance. Did the Prophet ﷺ ever say that to Uthman? He had thousands of camels. That's how rich he was. But whenever Allah's messenger called for donations, he would be the first one to donate. If you're a wealthy person like that, this is, mashallah, tabarakallah, the winner in the dunya and the winner in the akhirah. So you have to remember this, that you are just luxurious yourself. You don't do anything. Right? There are so many Muslims, subhanAllah. They live in mansions. You go knock on their door, your local masjid needs some money. Even giving a hundred dollars, he's making a very ugly face as if he's dying by just giving a hundred dollars. Like, brother, you live in a, like a two million dollar home. Why are you struggling to give a hundred dollars to the masjid? This is what is wrong. Right? You, aren't you happy with the blessings that Allah has given? Now spend in His religion. Spend for His sake. You have such a big house, you don't want to help Allah's house? But this is where the problem comes. And as a Muslim, we should not be like that. Right? We end up losers this way. So the Prophet wasallam then in another narration, uh, in a Tirmidhi, he from Harith ibn Amr radiallahu anhu, now we have another added instruction to Mu'adh radiallahu anhu. We said in the beginning that Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he had the knowledge of what? He was one of the best in the knowledge of who, huh? the religion, but specifically halal and haram, the laws. So the Prophet ﷺ gave all these instructions to Mu'adh. And then at the end he says, when you go there, the people of Yemen become Muslim. كَيْفَ تَقْضِي How are you going to be the qadi, the judge over them? The, then Mu'adh replied to the Prophet Sallallahu I will judge the people by what I find in the Qur'an. Then the Prophet Sallallahu asked him, فَإِن لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ What if an issue comes up that it is not in the Qur'an? How are you going to judge the people then? So Mu'adh said, فَبِسُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Sallallahu if I don't find the answer in the Qur'an, I'm going to go to the sunnah of Allah's Messenger. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِن لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي سُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ What if an issue comes up that's not even in my sunnah? What are you going to do then? How will you judge the people then? How will you make the laws then? Then Mu'ad said, أَجْتَهِدُ رَأْيِ Then I'm going to use my opinion. Then I'll use my opinion. Then the Prophet ﷺ said to Mu'ad, Alhamdulillahi alladhi wafaqa rasoola rasoolillahi sallallahu alayhi wa All praises to Allah who has made suitable the messenger of the messenger of Allah. You are the most suitable messenger for, for my sake. You did the right thing. Your thinking is the right. So anything you want to do as a Muslim, an issue comes up, I have to go through the Qur'an. If it's there, it's there. If not, you have to come to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa if not for us, from this incident, 
All the fiqh principles stemmed from this, subhanAllah. From this one incident that the Prophet ﷺ sent to Mu'adh. All these imams that you know of, the fuqaha, whether it's the early ones like Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed, rahimahumullah, and other than them at that time. And everybody till today, when you go ask the Shaykh for a fatwa, he follows the same, if his aqidah is from Ahl Sunnah, he will follow the exact same methodology. Okay, you asked me a question, let me remember the Qur'an. If it's there, here's your answer. If it's not, let's go through all the ahadith of Rasulullah. If it's not, let's see what the Sahaba said. If it's not, then I'm going to use my own personal opinion, a mujtahid, based on whatever knowledge I have. Nobody jumps to his own opinion. There is a step you have to follow. That's the way. So this is the way for all Muslims. You gain knowledge of the Qur'an, you gain knowledge of the Sunnah. Then you're faced with issues that you don't have, that was not in the Qur'an, that's not in, in the Sunnah. You, then the person, you go to the mujtahid, then alim, who is able to make ijtihad, who has this, all this knowledge of fiqh, and you get the fatwa from that person. Imam Malik, subhanAllah, he had a, and this was only Imam Malik, no, the other Imams didn't do this. Imam Malik would go through the Qur'an, the Sunnah, the Sahaba statements and all of this. If he did not find an answer, he would go by the urf, the customs of the people of Medina. Why? He gave respect. This is the Prophet's city. What do the people of Medina do with regards to this? That's my fatwa. That was his ijtihad. Still, he did not want to give something from his own, subhanAllah. You see how fearful these ulama were? But most of us, if somebody, yeah, 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 I want to show off how much I know. Right? No, be careful. Do not give your own personal opinion. That's a sin. You have to be really sure that this is in the Qur'an, this is a hadith. The, the Sahaba did it this way. The ulama of the past, they did it this way. Right? So you follow that tradition. And we see this, questions, questioning back and forth with Mu'adh. The Prophet ﷺ is asking him, and he is satisfied with the answer, the step-by-step -step process, you're good to go. Don't jump to your own personal opinions without going through the Qur'an, the Sunnah. Even the understanding, many times, like the hadith I gave. So many people from this ummah, they misunderstand. Oh, Islam is easy. No, just read the hadith properly and see what the sahaba said. Then you get the right understanding. You can read an ayah, you can read a hadith that's absolutely authentic. But even the understanding of that hadith and the ayah come from the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. You have to know about it. Oh, I read this hadith, but you're applying it in a different way. You're applying it in a way that the Prophet ﷺ never applied. None of the Sahaba ever applied this. Right? This is a mistake. You have the right knowledge, but you don't have the right application of the knowledge. So all of this, the Prophet ﷺ checked with Mu'adh, reviewed it, and then once he was satisfied with Mu'adh's answers, he said, you're good to go. Now go to Yemen and spread Islam there. And this was the way. And the last thing, and we'll end with this and go to uh, some questions. The last thing the Prophet ﷺ told Mu'adh, أَحْسِنْ خُلُقَكَ لِلنَّاسِ يَا مُعَادِ بْنَ جَبَلْ Have good manners with the people. Have good manners with the people. You're taking Islam to them. And this is very important, us living among non-Muslims. If your behavior is worse than the kafir, who's going to learn Islam from you? Right? Your behavior has to reflect your religion. So that's the last thing he told Mu'adh. Ahsin khuluqaka linnas. Be, be mindful of how you behave with the people. Be nice with them. Be kind with them. Okay, smiling is from the sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ said. Even when you smile at somebody, right? Not the flirtatious smiles you give to women. Don't do that. That's haram, right? <laughs> right? Get married, give that smile all you want to your wife. That's fine. But men giving a smile to another man, women giving a smile to another woman, right? Even smiling at somebody for, to your brother, to your sister is a, is a form of sadaqah, a charity. So if you are a Muslim living among the non-Muslims, you're out, uh, there is peace in your face, you are approachable, you don't look scary, you're not always grumpy, pushing people away, people will come and talk to you, right? People will come and talk to you. So, and, and you behave with them nicely, the best of the manners. And we go back, remember when we were talking about marriage. Whenever you get married, you look for religion and you look for what? 
husnul khuluq, good manners. Because the man or the woman who has good manners, Allah forbid, even if you end up in divorce, you will not abuse each other because they have good manners. That's the benefit. You have some people, subhanAllah, and I've met families like that. Qadr Allah, they just didn't work out, they divorced, nobody abused anybody, everything is fine, they're still looking after the children very nicely, the children don't have psychological problems, everything is fine. You go back and see the manners. Then you have other people, they pray five times a day, ugly divorces. Either the man abused the wife or the wife abused the man and now the kids have mental problems, all sorts of craziness because they didn't have the manners. So that's why you look for deen and manners. That's what's going to protect your family. Even when you and your wife have a fight, the one who fears Allah and has good manners, this man will not verbally abuse the woman or the wife will not abuse. Say, you know what? They'll know. We're both angry. Let's not talk right now. Let's take a break. Let's come back when me and you are not angry. The one who has good manners will understand that. So every act of life, manners will go a long way. Right? I, I, I've seen... Uh, subhanallah and may Allah protect us from being this way somebody serving as an imam of a masjid right somewhere he's in the street oh my goodness subhanallah every foul English word that you can find he's cursing at people out of anger who's gonna go to this imam to learn anything who <laughs> right like, you can be angry that's fine anger is a normal human thing but come on I mean your mouth should have a filter as an imam Right? So you find all sorts of weird things out there. This is why Mu'adh, you're going to be a person of position. You're going to be in a leadership position. You're going to be the governor. You're going to be in charge of that whole country. You have to have manners. People will come all sorts of ways. Right? Sometimes, subhanAllah, people might bother you. Somebody calls your phone at 2 a.m., 1 a.m., if I pick up the, will you shut up and stop calling me, <laughs> right? No one will ever call me again because this person will go tell everybody else in the, oh, don't call the sheikh. The best thing, don't pick up at that time. They'll understand. Or if you do, brother, sis, this is very late, I need to sleep. Inshallah, we'll talk tomorrow. There's a way, right? You have to have manners. People in leadership position in, in the community, especially because this is what Mu'adh was. So again, go back, every man, it's us as leaders of the homes, we're going to make mistakes sometimes, and we do. When you have that leadership position, manners will go a long way. Because people look up to the leaders who have good manners. It's like, you know what, what he said, it's a little tough on me, but mashallah, the brother is nice. He's, he's a good person, I'm sure he's saying this, you know, because he cares about me. They'll, they'll start thinking at least, but the manners goes a long way. So inshallah, uh, what is it? Oh, give the adhan for Asha, and in the meantime, sisters, if you have questions, uh, you can send it up, and the brothers, you can ask your question. Uh, okay, all right.